section one. You will hear a conversation between two people about off-campus university excursions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What can I do for you? Yes, I understand the university offers uh, organized trips to... Correct. We have about three trips per month on both weekdays and weekends. There are three trips per month, so that has been written in the notes. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What can I do for you? Yes, I understand the university offers uh, organized trips to... Correct. We have about three trips per month on both weekdays and weekends. I see. Can I ask what kind of places do you go to? Certainly. Well, usually there are excursions to the city. There are many interesting cultural venues to see, such as theatres and art museums. We also organise trips to the local mountains for hiking, or sometimes even to discount shopping areas around here. We don't organise guided tours, since most students like to explore on their own. How far away are they usually? Well, it's a good thing the city is not too far south of here, since most of the excursions we organise go there. They are never more than two hours away. And so, how much do I have to pay for each excursion? Oh, the great thing is that the transportation is free. You pay for just entrance fees and the like, or for whatever you buy. That sounds great. Yes, and for certain events, like theatre shows, you can get a discount on tickets when you buy them through the school. Oh, really? So how do I buy discounted tickets? When we travel to the venue, you will be given a discount at the box office or the ticket booth if you show your school identification card. You can also purchase tickets beforehand for you and your friends from the university website at the discounted price. All right. What part of the website is it? Well, log on to the university website with your ID number. Right. The login screen on the main page. There will be a section called Campus Activities on the navigation bar on the left side. In that section, there is another link for off-campus excursions. The monthly schedule is shown there, and there is also an online form to purchase any discount tickets available. Nice. Thanks for the advice. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, yeah, my computer is down. Can I ask you what excursions there are this month? Yeah, it's the beginning of the school year, so the new schedule isn't up on the website yet. But I have the schedule here on my computer. We have all the dates confirmed, and when the site is updated, you'll be able to buy discount tickets from there. Thanks. I am pretty busy during the week, so maybe you could just tell me about some of the next few ones coming up on the weekends. Definitely. The weekend before October break, there is a bus going to Big River Valley Park. That's the... let me see... that's the 12th. This is a hiking trip to see fall foliage, so there will be a small entrance fee of $11 to enter the park. It's a six-hour excursion. Oh, wonderful. The fall colors are so gorgeous that time of year. The week after October break, there is a bus going to Woodbury Grove. That's the 26th of October. It has a lot of outlet stores. It's very popular at this time of the year because students like to buy things for their dormitory rooms. What's an outlet store? An outlet store is a kind of discount store. Um, could you spell that? Outlet. O-U-T-L-E-T. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. So, yeah. That bus leaves at 11 p.m. and comes back at 6 p.m. All right, got it. 
The next weekend, on Sunday, there is a trip going down to the city. So yes, on the 3rd of November, students can visit the Museum of Contemporary Art. They have a new exhibition showing modern Chinese art. That sounds really interesting. How much is it? The school has a special arrangement with the museum, so it's free with your student ID. I'll definitely go to that one. When will the bus be leaving? It leaves from Lauder Hall at 12 p.m. and gets back around 9 p.m., so it will be nine hours. Wow, thanks for all the info. No problem. If you have any other questions about the off-campus excursions, feel free to email me. Okay, here, I have a pen. What is it? It's paladin at mail.com. Hmm, could you spell that? Paladin, P-A-L-A-D-I-N at mail.com. Thanks again. It's my pleasure. Don't worry about it. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Test 1. Listening. Section 2. You will hear an extract from a radio program for people who live abroad. Listen and answer questions 11 to 17. Program for people who live abroad. Listen and answer questions 11 to 17. You're listening to Expat News, a weekly broadcast for the English-speaking community in this great city. In today's programme, we'll be hearing from Tom O'Hara, who's going to tell us about all those different associations he can join. Tom. Good evening. Yes, in a city with so many of its residents born outside the country, it's hardly surprising there's such a huge range of expatriate clubs and societies. And many of these, of course, are aimed at English speakers. So, first, and perhaps most obviously, we have the sports clubs, which in some cases field teams in things like rugby and tennis that compete against clubs in other parts of the country, or even abroad. You don't have to play at this level to have fun, though. They can be just a great way to do some exercise. And, of course, to get to know other people, especially if you're new in town. The same can be said of the many hobby and interest clubs that have sprung up here. Everything from landscape photography, such as the Viewfinders Club in the Harbour District, or Focus on the Airport Road, to old favourites like stamp collecting. Remember that this country has a long tradition of unusual and perhaps even eccentric societies, so there should be something for everyone. A place where you can meet people of different nationalities with the same social and or cultural interests as you. For those who may be interested in rather more than just friendship, there's a wide range of lively social clubs. Several singles associations organise dancing of various kinds, while, for people in a real hurry, there's speed dating, in which everyone talks to everyone else for just five minutes. Then, at the end, they decide which of them they would like to meet again by ticking their names on a list. In complete contrast to these are the many religious associations, reflecting the diversity of faith groups present in this multicultural city. Many of them, of course, have their own places of worship, Perhaps also of interest to those who've come here from other parts of the world are the international and cultural societies. These often provide a meeting place for people from a specific country, China, for instance, and particular ethnic groups, such as Afro-Caribbeans. As in other major cities, we have here local branches of many charities with names familiar around the world. Meetings of human rights organisations like Amnesty International are held regularly in English, as are those of environmental groups such as Greenpeace. All funds raised, by the way, go to the same kinds of good cause as they do in other countries you may have lived in. 
Inevitably, perhaps, there are also the political clubs, often connected with a particular party and, indeed, a particular country. So we have, for example, a local association of Republicans linked to and campaigning for that party in the US. And Liberal Democrats here doing the same for their party in Britain. Finally, on a lighter note, there's plenty to choose from in the performing arts. Whether you enjoy taking part or just watching and listening, you can take your pick from a whole range of groups. To take just a couple of examples, there's light opera at the Memorial Hall in the city centre, or a very lively amateur theatre company in the Park District. In summer, they give open air performances of Shakespeare plays, free of charge. Test one, listening. Section two. Now answer questions 18 to 20. I should mention at this point that clearly some districts have a higher concentration of English speaking clubs than others, and that certain parts of town tend to specialise in particular activities. An obvious example would be the number of water sports clubs down near the river. Whatever the number though, they usually have one thing in common. With the exception of a few associations linked to particular countries and supported by their embassies here, in the vast majority of cases, it is the individual members who fund them, so an entry fee or a subscription will be charged. You may be used to council-subsidised sports centres and the like in your home country, but I'm afraid that's not the case here. Assuming you can afford it then, you can be fairly sure that somewhere out there you'll find a club that caters for your own particular fascination. If it's very important to you and you intend to spend a lot of time on it, it might even determine which district of the city you decide to live in. In the unlikely event that you really can't find such a club, the solution is to try to persuade friends and anyone else you meet of the need for one. You could also use the local small ads on the internet to suggest the idea. You'll be amazed at just how many people share even the strangest interest. Then you can start your own. That is the end of section two. Section 3. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a wildlife presentation. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Katie. Hi, Ian. Come on in. Hi, Professor Gordon. We wanted to talk to you about our wildlife presentation next week. Have you decided how to organise it? Yes, Professor. At first, we were going to focus on the cat family, but then we decided to talk about nocturnal animals instead. Yes, good idea. And how is your planning going? It's going well. We think we have enough material for 20 minutes. The advantage is that there are so many visual aids we can use. we found lots on the internet which we think will be really interesting for people. The problem is that this topic has been hard to narrow down. If anything, we've got too much information for just 20 minutes. How do you think we could narrow it down further? It is a broad subject. There are a few ways you could do it, but I'd recommend just looking at a representative sample of nocturnal animals, just four or five. Yes, and maybe we could choose one animal from each continent, or a land creature, a marine creature and a winged animal. I like the idea of separating it by different types of animals. And if we limit the detail, we'll definitely have enough time. But don't limit the detail too much. Also, think how you're going to interest the audience. Well, we're going to have a picture for each animal so we can talk through the picture. That's a nice idea, but don't limit yourself to pictures. 
If you can find any clips of the animals, use them. Showing brief video clips can keep an audience interested. I'll look on the internet tonight. And think of questions to ask your audience. People like to be involved. Yes, that's a great idea. Anyway, Professor, we've been practicing our presentation and we'd like to show you a small section. Is that OK? Well, we just have a couple of minutes left, but go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, we were thinking of presenting each animal with a picture and describing their physical characteristics. OK, but not in too much detail. That's just background information. We'll start with the jaguar. I'll introduce it by saying that the jaguar is a nocturnal animal and the only species of the genus Panthera to be found in the Americas. Like any cat, it has whiskers and it can move quickly. Its spine has great movement, meaning a jaguar can take long strides, sometimes up to five and a half metres. This can make it a deadly predator, as you can imagine. Moving on to the fur, its fur is quite distinct. The markings are like black donut-shaped spots on its otherwise yellow fur. People often confuse them with a leopard for this reason. Now, the tail is interesting. Although people think that the tail has stripes on it, the fur on the tail actually is similar to the body, with black circles around the lower section. The jaguar is generally a creature to be feared. Oh yes, I should have mentioned this earlier. Sorry, like most cats, it has sharp, retractable claws. Yes, that's fine, but be careful. The jaguar is usually thought of as nocturnal, but strictly speaking, it's crepuscular. In other words, most active between dusk and dawn. But as long as you mention this, you can put it under the umbrella of nocturnal. Is that all? Yes, I think so. Thanks, Professor. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. We'll hear an introduction of the exhibition named Two Centuries of the Bike. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our exhibition, Two Centuries of the Bike. Let's stroll around the exhibition, shall we? Although there were a few early efforts back in the 1700s, you didn't really see many bikes till, say, the 1830s in England. Bikes were a response to the rapid growth of cities early in the 19th century. Cities like London were getting too big to walk across. The early bike let people travel with less effort than walking. Plus, a bike was a lot cheaper than a horse. Think of it. No one invited a bike for, what, 5,000 years of human history. Why did people do it then? Probably because this was the start of the machine age. People wanted machines to do all the work. 
There were some drawbacks, however. For one thing, there were no pedals. You simply pushed yourself along using your feet, kind of like today's skateboard. That meant you went fairly slow, and uphill you actually worked harder, pushing that two-wheeler. Plus, the wheels were made of wood covered with metal, as you can see from this model. So the downside was that the ride was quite uncomfortable on most roads. Only a few gadget lovers had or used them. By the 1860s, though, improvements were being made. As you can see from this specimen, metal frames had become the rule. They are more durable than wood, and they don't warp in the rain. The biggest improvement, however, was the development of the chain and sprocket system. They are connected. This meant you did not push the bike. You used pedals, just like today. You had to try harder to balance, so it took some practice to figure out how to use the pedals. But it made the ride so much easier. As a result, the good thing was that you could ride a lot more smoothly and with very little effort. By the 1880s, another big change was the use of rubber wheels. These became pretty common at that time. Though the first ones were solid rubber, the ride was a good deal more comfortable than the old iron and wood system. This is a big consideration, because the faster you go, the more you feel every bump. Air-filled tyres, pneumatic tyres, didn't really come into use till around the year 1900, as you can see from this exhibition over here. That made the ride even more comfortable. So by 1890 or so, people were going a lot faster and a lot more smoothly. There was one problem when you were going quickly and comfortably. Oh no, how do I stop? Yes, we all laugh now, but for a long time, the only way to stop was to drag your feet. That didn't work very well, and it would be dangerous if you were going fast. In the crowded cities of those years, New York, Chicago, and so on, you'd get killed if you couldn't stop for, say, a streetcar. Plus, look at this bike. The front wheel is nearly a metre and two-thirds tall. They made them that way so you could see over people in wagons, but you couldn't drag your feet. This model is called a velocipede, a speed pedal. Another characteristic of the bike in this period is that it has two equal-sized wheels, which signalled a big change in bikes. For with the velocipede, brakes appeared. If you wanted to stop, you just pushed the pedal backwards. Doing that stopped the back wheel of the bike. This technique worked a lot better than dragging your feet or jumping off the high seat there. This meant that bikes became a great deal safer. It would have been safer if people wore helmets, but the first bicycle helmet wasn't invented until years later, and even then, it was little more than a leather ball cap. It really wasn't until the 1970s that the bike helmet was modified to provide some real protection. Before continuing on to look at developments since the 1890s, let's say a word more about safety. Everyone knows if you're going downhill, you can get going dangerously fast. To go more than 100 kilometers an hour isn't all that difficult, but even on level ground, it's easy to go too quickly. On a city street, today's bicycles can be ridden at a speed of over 40 miles an hour over a short distance. That's about 64 kilometers an hour. Remember, you're on a bike, not in a car. There's nothing to protect you. People are killed in single bicycle accidents every day, just from hitting the road. A good rule to remember is, if you're going faster than the cars, slow down. And please, wear a helmet. Nearly one quarter of the epilepsy cases come from head injuries in accidents on bikes and motorcycles. I don't mean to scare you, but safety is everyone's business. What? Now that's a good question. Why are today's bikes so much faster? Well, it's not just that today's athletes are faster. The answer is partly mechanical. If you look closely here at the back wheel, you'll see a number of gears. Changing gears is what makes those fast speeds possible. You can shift gears depending on the terrain and how hard you wish to pedal. So you can put it on a higher gear for downhill and a lower gear for uphill travel to make it easier to climb that slope. You'll notice this gear shifting mechanism is attached to the back wheel. And when the rider shifts on the handlebar gear shifter, the chain moves to the appropriate sprocket. And, speaking of changing gears, let's look over here at our Tour de France exhibit. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.